After his friend, Didi Kerman, was shot down over Southeast Kerman, Jebediah saw the need for a piloting and tactics school. So, using whatever resources he can get his hands on, including an abandoned hangar on the island airfield, Jebediah starts with his first crop of new pilots, scientists, and engineers. That is correct. Even the scientists and the engineers will be taught how to fly. This should enable the Central Kerbin Alliance Network to regain dominance in the air over Southeast Kerbin and preeminence in space. Although she seems a little apprehensive, Jeb selects Sandberg to go up first. Although she's already a trained pilot, she's a little hesitant at Jeb's request that she fly through the hangar. Jebediah reassures her and says to consider this test just pass-fail, as he always considered those kind of tests easier anyway. Sandburr throttles down, lines up with the hangar, and easily close through, but then has to activate the afterburners to fly up and avoid the mountain on the other side. Jebediah intends to pass on his knowledge to this current crop of Kerbals, and hopefully they too will pass on this knowledge to others thus increasing the chances that every Kerbal makes it back home. And if you are curious about the decals on this plane, they are from the mod Conformal Decals. In addition to training on dogfighting tactics and piloting techniques, Jeb is also helping train this crew to go to Duna. Jebediah knows that flying on Kerbin is tricky, but flying on Duna is a whole nother level. With all of this training and with another mission to Duna, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network should have the best pilots, not just on Kerbin, but in the entire solar system. While Jebediah has been busy with pilot training, the research and development team at the Space Center has also been busy. In large part to the last mission to Duna, many new technologies have been unlocked. So CCAN has authorized a second mission to Duna, this time with their all-new, nerve-powered Ranger Shuttle. Equipped with the latest technologies, and, with the experience gained from the first mission to Duna, this shuttle has much more lifting surface and four times the thrust. And, all the control surfaces have been tested to withstand re-entry heating. So, with the best technologies and the best trained pilots, this mission has a high likelihood of success. That, and, Valentina is the captain for this mission. In addition to the crewed landing mission, Another Mariner mission is also being sent towards the Red Planet. This probe is equipped with the latest high-resolution surface scanning technologies. And, in addition to being able to scan the surface, it is also equipped with a relay antenna. With the addition of a second relay in orbit around Duna, the crew should be better able to stay in contact with Kerbin through the duration of the mission. During the transfer window, both the probe and the shuttle will be departing Kerbin. In order to better control two missions like this, I use the mod Kerbal Alarm Clock to help me keep track of my different maneuvers and switch back and forth between the two crafts. Much of the functionality of that mod has been incorporated into the base game, and for this mission, I actually was using both the in-game alarm clock and the mod. While the crew heads to Duna, Mariner 1 found something interesting on the surface, and this will be added to the mission itinerary to check out this odd structure on the surface. Some scientists are looking at the imagery from the Mariner probe and saying, this is the find of the century. Others are saying, it's just a normal rock, there's no reason to get too excited. Like the first mission to Duna, this shuttle will also utilize aero braking in order to save on the Delta V requirements to get into orbit around the planet. For the entire crew, this is an extraordinary experience, as none of them have ever been to Duna before, and most of them haven't even been outside of low Kerbin orbit before. If someone were to give some kind of arbitrary star rating to this crew, most of them would only be a one star, but after a mission like this, they might be something such as like a three star crew. It's as if new abilities are being unlocked. As the shuttle re-enters due to its atmosphere, the crew banks it slightly to help it turn towards the target area. Valentina decides that they should try and land in that low, flat-looking area to the left of the target. The shuttle will fly the best when it is in the lowest and thickest part of Duna's atmosphere. Since there are no runways on Duna, the crew needs to find an area as flat as possible to avoid damaging the shuttle. As they near the surface, the contours and the terrain become more visible. As they come in for a landing, 
Valentina turns on the reaction control thrusters, and Johnny deploys the chute. Together, the two systems help the craft come in for a smooth landing. As they roll on the surface, Valentina points the shuttle towards the objective. That way, it won't be quite as long a walk. Once the craft comes to a stop, Valentina excitedly gets out and begins the important task of planting the Central Carbon Alliance Network flag. With their mission commander task now complete, it's time for the scientists and engineers to get to work. Next, Samdo gets out and begins downloading and collecting all the different scientific data from the craft's entry into the atmosphere, and then reruns all of those experiments on the surface. And what's this? Samdo has found some Duna blueberries near the landing site. Unfortunately, these aren't the edible kind of blueberries, but the Kerbals back at R&D will be more excited with these anyway. The next item on the itinerary is for Tamuki Kerman to check out this odd structure. So far, it just looks like a large rock. Why would the satellite imagery of this thing get anyone excited on Kerbin? Because it looks like a Kerbal's face. Did someone carve this? Were Seacan Kerbonauts not the first ones on Duna? Maybe it's just some kind of natural structure with some odd lighting effects over it. But if it isn't, that would mean that there's someone or something else out there. Even though there's plenty of turmoil happening on Kerbin, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network needs to keep an eye in the sky, just in case. The crew and shuttle are able to achieve orbit around Duna again. From here, they will wait for the transfer window back to Kerbin. If an orbit is very circular and not very inclined, the in-game maneuver tool can do a good job of planting ejection burns, such as one from Duna back to Kerbin. Which is exactly what I did here. At the appropriate time, the shuttle is oriented to face its maneuver. Then, the crew lights the engine and begins their journey back home. The shuttle still has plenty of Delta V, which the crew will use to help pinpoint their landing back on Kerbin. This shuttle is packed with the latest technologies from the Central Kerbin Alliance Network. They must ensure that none of this lands in Communist territory. When the shuttle enters Kerbin's sphere of influence, it will make another maneuver to help fine-tune its aerobraking pass. And Engineer Rawai's Kerbin will get out and repack the parachutes. This may not be needed, but better safe than sorry. Depending how fast the shuttle is traveling when it touches down, this may help it slow down in sufficient time. Similarly to how they got into orbit around Duna, the crew will aerobrake around Kerbin first, then readjust their orbit in order to pinpoint their landing on the planet. The goal, as always, is to make their way back safely to the Space Center. The upgrades to the Ranger's design meant that it didn't have any issues with re-entry heating. After a small adjustment to the craft's orbit, it is now positioned to re-enter Kerbin's atmosphere and land at the Space Center. The large wings should help the craft glide its way back to the runway. The craft's orbital inclination was off just a little bit. However, using the atmosphere, they can correct that and then line up directly with the runway. Even though I have played this game for many years, I still think it's exciting to be able to take a craft from orbit and land it back on the runway. Valentina continues to bank the craft in order to help line up properly with the runway. She has to be careful not to lose too much energy with these maneuvers so that she still has enough speed to make it all the way back to the runway. There's still a little bit of fuel left in the craft, so she can fire the engines if she needs to. The nerve engines don't work well in the low atmosphere, but they can work well enough to give the craft just a little bit of a push. The velocity looks good, the descent rate looks good, this should be another successful Duna mission. The landing gear are lowered, and touchdown! The crew has returned safely, and they've brought with them a large haul of scientific data. In addition to that, they've gained lots of valuable piloting experience. These graduates of Jebediah's piloting and tactical school are shaping the battlefield over Southeast Kerbin. Working together, Johnny and his wingman have already downed one MiG, but they are still being threatened by a second. Johnny works his way onto the tail of the second MiG. The MiG tries to shake him, but Johnny stays with it. The MiG deploys countermeasures and avoids Johnny's missiles, but can't escape his gunnery skills. 
This new level of training ensures that Didi's loss was not in vain. But still, the question remains, what did Seacan find on the surface of Duna? If that structure was artificial, were its makers friendly or hostile? I am Echo 3. Thanks for joining me to discuss the Cold War. I will see you next time.